Dwayne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Hey, it's exciting to have you. Uh, I've had the opportunity to dive into your book, and you just have such a wide range of life experiences to share with our audience, and you're in that age group. You're in what I call job optional, but you continue to work because you love what you do, and so we're going to get into purpose. We're going to get into some health habits. We're going to talk about some of your books, and uh, I can't wait to get into some of those things, but you've got such an interesting background. I want to make sure we get there first, and I wanted to kick it off with something that I've seen in a lot of different areas. In doing my research on you, Dwayne, potato soup seems to come up a lot. And mm-hmm. could you just, I, I think to you, potato soup means something a little bit different than it does to the average American. Yeah, well, it, this was an incident that occurred, um, geez, many years ago, probably 45 years ago when I was in high school. Uh, my, I, I was raised by a single mom, kind of a poor working family. I was the youngest of four children. I was kind of a juvenile delinquent, to be honest with you. And my mom took me out of public schools, moved me 100 miles to a private Catholic school and started, I had to retake my sophomore year over because my first sophomore year, I decided it was more for racing cars and dating girls than it was for school. And so I uh, started my life over in this small a Catholic school in, in a town called Walla Walla. It's now more famous for its wine than anything else. Um, and uh, my mom came home from work one day, and she she was kind of solemn. She walked in the door in our small kind of studio apartment, and uh, she said, we have no money. And, you know, smart Alex, 16-year-old kid, go, well, what's new, you know? And she walked over to the refrigerator. She didn't spar with me. She opened the refrigerator, looked in. There was like a half a can of condensed milk, a cube of butter, and uh, and an onion, and she said, uh, we're going to have to steal some food from work, and I kind of looked at her. My, my mom was like the most ethical woman. She never sold anything in her life, and uh, she said, I think we'll you know, steal some potatoes, and we can live off potatoes for a couple weeks. I'll make potato soup. So that was a very weird you know, experience for a high school kid to, to, to experience. We, we made like bank robbers at four o'clock in the morning. She went in, we took a five gallon bucket of big white bucket of potatoes and, and made off like a bank robbery. And, and I was saying, well, take steaks, you know, and she's like, you know, she actually gave me a good whack across the face. She said, no, I'm not going to take anything expensive. And I want you to know, I'm going to pay these back and I'm going to pay them back with interest. And we did. Uh, when she got paid, she paid the potatoes back and, and even more. But, you know, it was a profound experience for me during those two weeks where, you know, she would say, hey, I know you're going to reach some level of greatness. I'm, I know you're going to have uh, employees that work for you, but never underestimate the fact that they could be going through some severe hard times. Always be in touch with your employees and they'll be there for you. And that was a profound lesson for me. You know, I've been in business uh, 35 years now and probably no greater words had have had an imp- impact on me. So when I started my company, we started the Potato Soup Foundation, and it helps people in times of trauma. I mean, we've helped people in cases of domestic violence, where people's homes burn down, where people have medical tragedies, when people's parents die, and so the fund has been incredible. And what 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 I'm most proud of about the Potato Soup Foundation is that our staff starting to contribute to it. So staff that you know are not highly compensated people. There's over 500 people that. You know, even if it's five dollars a paycheck, they contribute to it. So we we created an organization of sustainability where where employees care for one another, which I think is amazing. Yeah, and, and that potato soup. I, I take it you haven't uh, stolen any potatoes since. I've been uh, potato stolen free. No, I think uh, <laughs> our, our company's done very well, and you know now is this my time to to give back, and and hopefully no one else will be in that situation ever again in their life that yeah. knows me anyway. Well, I know your mom's meant a lot to you, and she's helped uh, get you to where you are today with a lot of the lessons that were taught along the way. And one of the things that came up in some of my research is uh, you just striving to live, in your words, the greatest life possible. And I wondered, what... That's kind of a, uh, you know, a, a difficult thing to wrap our head around, yeah, and it's a different definition for everyone. How do you define greatest life possible? Well, I, think, I think the definition is different for everybody, correct? I mean, mm-hmm. your, your greatest life possible may not be my greatest life possible and vice versa. Um, I, I think one of the things my mother gave me, and I, 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 have, I now have nine grandchildren. I only have two children, but nine grandchildren. And... 
when they talk to me about parenting, one of the things that I advise them to do is I say, well, the greatest gift my mom gave me was confidence. She would, you know, every day she would tell me, hey, you're going to be president of the United States. You're going to do this. You're going to be a CEO. You know, and, you know, your, your program center, your brain just starts believing this stuff. So you don't think that it's, that it's weird that you accomplish these incredible, you know, uh, feats. You just think it's your path, right? And um, so when I thought about my greatest life possible, what I wanted to avoid is boredom. You know, a, a lot of people wanted to reach, you know, material success and, you know, have a huge balance sheet and stuff. And I, I've accomplished those goals. Um, you know, our, our company owns almost $3 billion in real estate. So been very successful that way. But that that's not, for me, the greatest life possible. You know, that for me, it involves having a variety of things that you're very passionate about. So, you know, I own a film company. I'm, I'm writing my sixth and seventh book right now. I've, you know, my, my book that I wrote about my mother uh, called My Mother, My Son is being made into a Hollywood movie right now. Um, I wrote a play that's traveling. Um, I, I took up sculpting a, a year ago uh, in Italy, and I, every year I go to Italy to be taught by a master. So what I never wanted to happen for myself is to be bored. And a big part of that is I feel like I have a duty to give back. And so all the books I write, um, the movies I do, everything, all that, all those funds, the profits go to charity. Um, we have a chain of coffee shops called the Queen Bee Coffee Shops that were dedicated to my mom. 100% of, of the profits go to charity. We're building our fourth one right now. So, you know, I think, I, I think a lot of people say, what's my greatest life? And people think, oh, you know, I'm going to have this great boat and go fishing and golfing every day. And for me, there's a there's an absolute uh, corresponding statistic about what you do in your elderly years and how long you live. And so, you know, there's there's good studies behind this that you know if you, if you if you retire at 62 and you just go golfing, you're going to live less than the guy who has this passionate career. Maybe works a little longer and gets into a philanthropic endeavor. And so, you know, and the greatest example, that's the presidency of the United States. So we can talk about a, a study that I did with, with presidents and, you know, why Jimmy Carter is still building, you know, houses for Habitat for Humanity houses at 95. And, you know, his brother died of pancreatic, pancreatic cancer at 52. His sister died at 56. His dad died at, at 57, all of pancreatic cancer. And here he is, 95 climbing on roofs and so on. And it's, you know, it's purpose. That, that, that is the longevity elixir that we should all be drinking. You know, was there a transition point for you throughout your life where you realized, okay, now I do have enough. Maybe it's not about money, but you had been focused. So, you know, we all need to feed our families. There's this Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing that, that happens throughout our lifetime. And at some point we go, okay, you know, I, I do have enough. Maybe I don't need to make any more money and I can focus on more of these philanthropic pursuits or focus on some of my passions, right? Was there a transition point that you went through at sometime during your life where you realized it wasn't about money? Well, I wouldn't use the word it's not enough because, you know, enough for what? Um, you know, the greatest longevity programs in the world right now are be, being done by Google and they're being funded privately by the founders of Google. The greatest healthcare initiatives in the world right now are being done by the Gates Foundation. You know, so enough for what? I mean, and, and I don't want to wax political here, but, you know, when we say, you know, billion, there should be no billionaires in the world, you know, the issue is I think, I think billionaires have a responsibility to give back and to create for the greater good for humanity and so on. And, you know, Bill Gates lives, you know, half a mile from my house here. And, you know, he has done so much good in the world. He's, he's ending diseases. He's changing sanitation standards and so on. And, you know, people like that, um, they're, they're incredible. And, you know, he's not driving around and, you know, buying six new cars every week. And, and you know, he's a guy that really is, has the greater good at, at heart. So I don't, I don't cap my potential um, either in terms of my intelligence, my net worth, my, my passion. Um, I think but I think there's a responsibility that we have. And I think a lot of that comes with parenting, right? I mean, my mom, you know, talked about 
uh, philanthropic uh, ventures a lot. We, did, we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't, but she would give to the church. She would do things like that. But I think it's incumbent if you do well, and you, you have to understand if you do well financially, you're not the only one that did it. You know, the, the, your friends, your family, your employees, your vendors, your, your customers, all these people that helps you get there, you have a debt to them. And that, that's the way I view my life. And, and um, you know, I think, I think that's how you have purpose in life. Well, I think there's a lot to be said about all the things that you went through there. And one being, you know, living your greatest life possible, you know, living within your purpose. That's the purpose itself might mean something different to everyone. But I have seen time and time again that the biggest uh, downfall for retirees is boredom. Yeah. And that is not isolated to just one individual. That's not a unique, you know, thing. Everyone needs to make sure they have a lot of ponies on the track, if you will. They've got a lot of different things that they're involved in that keep them excited. And for some, you know, maybe that's golf, but let's make sure it's not just golf. There's other things and passions that you're involved in. And one of those things for you is the uh, assisted living facilities that you've built uh, through Aegis. And can you talk a little bit about Aegis and why you founded that company, why you uh, really focus so much time on those efforts? Yeah. And before I do that, though, I want to ask you a question, Casey. Yeah. So, it, God forbid you walked out the door and you got hit by a semi and, you know, entered the pearly gates tomorrow. What would you consider are your three living artifacts, things that live beyond your, your, your place on this planet, your, your alive place on this planet? Do you have three living artifacts? When you we know say what I, art- I, yeah. I'm going to go with my children and right. my business and right. I, and then maybe this is too high level, but I'd say all of those families that I've touched personally throughout the years. Yeah, excellent. So one of the concepts I'm trying to get through to people is to think more about your living artifacts, right? And I say living because you create them when you're alive. So my, my social worthy documentaries are a living artifact for me. My books are a living artifact for me. My play is a living artifact for me. The buildings I build are living artifacts for me. The, the business that I've built is a living artifact. The employees that I've affected, the, the sculptures that I've created. And so what, what I think around this topic of purpose is, is you have to, we're, we're all in the spinning ball for a very short period of time. And you don't know if it's 40 years or, you know, 110 years. You don't, we don't know. So we should spend a lot more time thinking about, you know, how do I make my, my own place in this world? How do I make a sustainable place in this world with my living artifact that's going to affect humanity in a positive way? And I don't think, I, I think people think about making money. I think they think about buying a house. I think they think about being a good parents. But I don't think we think about our own personal living artifacts, which I think is huge. And when we say artifacts, is that, uh, are, are these items, are these physical things we can touch? Could this be humans as well? Sure, uh, it makes absolutely. Me also think along the lines of what we've made our BHAG, you know, our big right. hairy goal over here right. at Howard Bailey is to become uh, a, a company that continues to make a positive impact in the lives of our clients, our employees, and our communities into right. the next hundred years. So, and that, that could be an artifact but then you've also got the books you've got the tv shows the podcasts the only thing i would say about that casey is i i think to be a living artifact it has to be measurable and and it it can't be too squishy right so and it's got to be something outside of the norm i like you know i think being a father and a grandfather is an incredible artifact but i think it's i think it's the expectation right it's not it's not it's not a behag and so i think i think in terms of creating you know, whatever. I, hey, I built this phenomenal building. This person had an incredible sense of, they, they, they developed this song, you know, they did this movie, whatever it is. Um, those become the living artifacts of our, of our culture and community. And what, what is helpful then is then when you leave this planet, um, the place is a better place, you know, than when you entered the world because you, you created these things. And I think, we would be better as a society, as a country, as a, as, a, as a race, if we thought this way. And that that then starts to define purpose, right? Because you go, well, what are the things I'm passionate about? 
that could be a living artifact. And I think, I think we get caught in this rut of boredom, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to go hella skiing, I'm going to go golfing, I'm going to go fly fishing, I'm, you know. And, you know, you retire at 62 and you do those things for 15, 20 years and you're like, yeah, this is my life. I, I think if you really want to have incredible longevity and purpose, you got to step outside those lines of comfort. And that's, you know, in my conversations, I spent you know, three days with Bill Clinton about three weeks ago and did an interview with him and had lunch and dinner with him. And, you know, here he, he, he said, Dwayne, no one in my family has ever lived as long as I have. He's 72. He's, he said, no man has ever lived as long as I am. So they have, you know, heart problems and other issues and so on. And he said, the reason that we're living as long as we are is one reason, it's purpose, you know? I mean, that, that guy needs very little sleep, which I don't agree with because I think sleep <laughs> is foundational, but his memory is, is super. I mean, his memory is 10 times better than mine. And, uh, you know, he, he could talk for three hours about the most interesting things in the world. And he's flying around the world speaking and meeting people and involved in international events and the Clinton Foundation's doing great things. Jimmy Carter, the same thing, he's 95. Now, here's an interesting factoid for your listeners. If you look at the average vice presidents who have never, not become presidents, they're living about 15 years less than presidents. And you would say, huh, what's the deal there? We as human beings need to get, to get acknowledged and recognized for our accomplishments. And the vice presidents have a stigma that they're never fully recognized. That, you know, they were, they were second fiddle. They were always under the, the shadow of the president or whatever. And they're living 15 years less than the presidents. So on, on average, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant uh, difference. Well, if I'm a VP and I'm listening to this right now, if I'm Mike Pence, I'm going to be a little concerned. I'm going to go, well, okay, Dwayne, I get it. But, you know, what can I do about it? You know, what are the things that we can do as a VP or just like just an average, ordinary, in, everyday individual that's, you know, retiring from a factory job, stepping into retirement going, hey, you know, I, I want to have longevity. I want to live as long as the presidents, but I'm never going to get that level of recognition. What can we do? I think, I think that's where it comes into what is bubbles up inside you in terms of your passion, right? It doesn't mean you have to be president of the United States, but it, it does mean that, you know, you have to find this defined purpose beyond work. Most people's job is not their passion. It's not their purpose, right? They, they have that job because it has benefits. It pays the rent, the mortgage, whatever, but it's not their passion. They're not living their passion. And so you have to really sit down with yourself and say, hey, what am I passionate about? Um, you know, maybe I'm going to go rock crack babies in the hospital because it just is so incredibly powerful for me. You know, I've, I've interviewed, I don't know how many centurions and above, um, and it, all these people do something, you know, I mean, I mean, not again, not their typical, you know, gardening and so on, but they have some purpose, uh, that they go to. I, I interviewed, I think he was 97 years old and he, he was a shot putter and he wanted to go and every day he got up rain or shine. And he just wanted to put the shot an eighth of an inch further than he did the day before. You know, he was 97 years old. Didn't matter if it was snowing outside. That was my goal. That was, that was what kept him alive. I interviewed a, a eight, I think he was 88 year old sprinter and he just wanted a 10th of a second off his time. Didn't matter, you know, what the weather was. He was, he was out there practicing and training. And I think what happens, and you know, I've cared for about 60,000 elderly with ages living and throughout my career in other companies. And I think what happens is we give up on, off those goals when we retire. We give up on our passions, and we just do life. It's it, We put it on automatic pilot. And so for the average listener that's out there, you know, you have to have some, some, some goals that are measurable. You have to have some goals that you're passionate about. And hobbies are great. Golfing is fine. Fishing is fine. I, 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 you know, I don't want to get letters from the trade association saying I'm a down on golfing and fishing. <laughs> they're fantastic, but they're not purpose. They're hobbies. And, you know, you can say, well, my goal is to get, you know, a stroke off my golf score every day. It's great, but it's not really helping the world in a greater sense, right? And so I, I think you have to think much more globally about what you do. And that's going to help you live longer. That, that is an absolute key in terms of affecting your immune system and helping you stay healthy and living longer.
And what, what if you found this thing? What, what if you're one of the lucky individuals that sat down, you've really identified your passion, and if you've got any insight on how you might help someone kind of work through figuring out what those passions are, I'd love to hear it. But once you've figured out what that passion is, how you're going to make a positive impact in the world, how you're going to leave behind this lasting legacy in the way of artifacts, do you define it? Do you come up with a mission statement? Do you put it on your wall, your mirror? How do you utilize it on a forward basis? Well, I think it's how things make you feel. You know, and I'll just give you a for instance. You know, when I wrote this, this play, uh, it's, uh, it's called Seven Ways to Get There. I, you know, and we did, I don't know how many, 60 shows or something. I would sit in the audience almost every show. And I would just watch what kind of emotion I would invoke with the way things were written, right? So I watch where the laugh line came and when people cried and so on. And I'm like, I'm impacting that person's thought process. And that, that was really magical for me that, you know, I'm impacting how they are viewing a certain topic. So for me, I got these butterflies in my stomach that says, man, I really like this. You know, this is, I'm really all in here. The same with making a documentary. You know, I've, I've made six now, and they're all kind of social-worthy films. I've made ones on immigration. I made one on, on a Hall of Fame basketball player. I'm making one now on a on an NFL football player. I made one on a, um, Af- a women's Afghan cycling team. Um, you know, I've I've made one on 80 to 100 year old tennis players called Gold Balls. Uh, made one on a Holocaust survivor called Big Sonia. And when I watch these movies and, and the impact it has on people, you know, it's, uh, it's moving these people in a profound way. And that, that stimulates me in passion. I, I get passionate about it. So it may be somebody saying, hey, you know, I used to play the saxophone when I was in my teens. Maybe I'm going to, maybe I just take up the saxophone and, and start my own band and go out and play for fun, you know. It's that it's that butterfly in the tummy feeling that oh my god this is really lights me up. Um, I have a uh, I have a variety of charities and one of the one charities that that I started is a one called D One and it's it's underprivileged kids of color that are really good athletes that that need some mentoring some fathering and and some perspective on life and I I only take five kids in at a time every year and you know teach them everything from you know, credit scores to, you know, how to build their balance sheet to how to invest to, you know, I mean, we talk about FICO scores all the time. I mean, we talk about what to post on social media, you know, how many people don't make it in pro sports and so on. And that, you know, the impact that I have on these young men gives me butterflies, you know, I, I see their lives changing in front of me. And so that's, you know, and you asked me a question here a few minutes ago about Aegis Living and why I did it. And I always love to plug and promote my my company, so I wasn't trying to avoid your question. But that's the same feeling I get with Aegis because, you know, people come to us with their 83-year-old mom and are trusting us to do an incredible job. That's incredible, worthy work that I feel very blessed to have that responsibility. And when, you know, you see a person that's, that comes in and it's not very good condition and, and you turn their health around and, and their, their families are so grateful to you. They're like, Oh my God, thank you for running this company. That's magical. That's, that's pretty incredible. And, you know, our company has a culture that's second to none. We, we were uh, a year and a half ago, one glass door top 50, you know, companies to work for out of almost 700,000 companies nominated. We, we won the top 20 award again out of 650,000, 700,000 companies for workplace culture. So, you know, the top, the place that we spend time at um, is so significant. And if, if your work environment is toxic, if it's bad energy or whatever, that's going to affect how you feel about life. It's going to affect your immune system. It's going to affect your longevity. So we try to look at this in a very, healthy perspective in terms of our company and our culture. Now, some might be listening to this going, Dwayne, I, I just want to relax though. Yeah, you know, I've been working to the bone, you know, day after day. And it sounds like Dwayne's got his hands in a little bit of everything. He must be working 18 hours a day. And I'm just looking for a relaxing retirement. I want to have a meaningful life. I want to have a positive impact in the lives of those that are around me. However, I 
do want to take some time off. I do want to relax and I don't want to feel like, well, I've got to get up at six. I've got to get to the office by seven. I've got to get X, Y, and Z done. Then I'm not going to be able to leave till seven. I got to think about it over the weekend. You know, people want to escape that. Uh, right. What would you say to those individuals that want to escape that, but they still want to have this, you know, full life that you're living? Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to respond to that Casey in a variety of different ways. So hang with me on this. Um, I love cars. I've loved cars since I was seven years old. So I'm a, I'm a big car guy and have, have a car collection and so on. So let's say you go out and buy a brand new car. What's your favorite car, Casey? Oh, um, let's go with a, uh, let's go with a BMW V12 seven series. All right. So we got this BMW big, big engine in it. We take it out, we drive it for a week and, uh, you know, it's 2020 and then we go park it in the garage. We say, yeah, kind of bored with that. You know, I think, I think I'm into the new Mercedes uh, hybrid now and I'm just going to leave it in the garage. And you come back in five years and start that car up, it's well rested, right? You, you've, you've let it lay in the couch in the garage, so to speak. And, ah, well, the tires are flat. The battery's dead. The belts are corroded. The, you know, the, the battery's overflowing with battery acid. The, you know, everything doesn't work on it. We as human beings are not that much different than cars, right? So, you know, the expression is sitting is the new cancer, right? The, the fact is our bodies are meant to move. We're meant to move. And what has happened with the advent of things like, you know, this iPhone technology, now from my Barkle lounger, I can turn on the TV, turn on my Sonos system, open the gate, lock the doors, turn on the lights, order a pizza, you know, and call my cardiologist all at the same time without moving more than a few fingers. That has changed the trajectory of longevity for the first time in almost the history of man. We're starting to go backwards in longevity. We, this, this last year, we dropped, we dropped a, about three months. That is significant, and that's a trend that's going to continue to go backwards unless we start realizing our bodies, just like that car, just like that BMW, are meant to move. Now, you don't have to, be, you don't have to go out and run a race. Hey, if you can get eight to 10,000 steps in every day, you're going to be fine. Because that's going to you know, ward off, you know, all the all the bad things. But your bodies are meant to move. The second thing, the second way I would answer your question is, one of the most important things for me is what I call the morning flow. Okay, and think about, you know, I, I know you you did your CrossFit this morning, but think about how much time we spend on our morning flow. And let me give you an example of my morning flow. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I drink about 12 ounces of room temperature water that's on my nightstand. Now, during the night, your body has secreted anywhere from 12 to 20 ounces of fluid. But what do most Americans do? They get out of bed, they go to the bathroom, they head right for the coffee pot. Well, guess what that does? That dehydrates you, right? So when you drink that 12 and even as much as 20 ounces of water first thing before you go to the bathroom, your body has released all these toxins during the night. That's why we sleep. Your body has two purposes when you sleep. One is to get rid of bad, dead cells that cause things like cancer, or heart disease, diabetes, whatever. Your body then expels those bad cells. It's in, you've got to create this way for it to expel it. Well, we sweat, but then you've got to replenish it so you, you create this flow so these bad cells go away. The second reason we sleep is to regenerate the good cells. It's, it's the factory, and, it, and typically we need seven hours for the regeneration process to take place. So the first thing I do is drink that water. second thing I do is I wake my body up. I don't jump, leap out of bed. So you know, I wiggle my toes, wiggle my fingers, stretch. I do a stretch in bed for about five minutes. Then I get up, I go to the bathroom, I let in natural light into my, uh, into my house. I give gratitudes, you know, oh God, it's, even if it's raining, which often it does if you've heard in Seattle, I give my gratitudes, oh wow, this, that flower is really coming in nice, it's blooming great. Oh, the lake looks fantastic. Oh, you know, I really, the sun's out today. That's great. You know, I give my gratitudes. I then, uh, before anything else, I then go into a 20-minute meditation. So about half hour to an hour after I wake up, I do 20 minutes of meditation. 
And then, you know, depending on the day, I'll, I'll go work out and or go for a walk or lift or whatever. Um, and then I take a, 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 a long shower where I end it with a, a cool bath that, that actually invigorates me, a, a cool shower bath, I should say, where I turn it on nothing but cold. And your body and your brain actually wakes up. It will get you, it'll get rid of the brain, brain fog and you'll start your day in a much clearer day. Now, I say that, I offer this to you, you may go, well, where's it going with this? That is how you can have a really fulfilling life. If you just get out of bed, go pee and grab a cup of coffee, you're not experiencing the fullness of your brain and your body in that way, right? So that's, that's critically important that you do that. Um, the third thing in terms of I just want to get up and rest is that you're not going to live a long life by doing that. Right. And you can rest in a variety of ways. I'm not saying book your day, you know, six to six. Um, what what I would tell your listeners is avoid the noise in your life. And let me give you an example. I was just having this conversation with one of my staff yesterday. They go, they were asking me how I get so much done. And I said, well, I avoid a lot of the noise in my life. Like, well, what do you mean the noise in your life? And I said, well, things that that you get drug into that are absolutely a waste of your time. And it could be, you know, a family drama. Somebody calls you up and says, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? And, -so? and, -so? and, you know, next thing you know, you've spent 24 minutes talking about something toxic and negative that you don't want to get drawn in. It. So you just cut those out of your life. And the next thing, it may be, you know, an employee comes in your office and says, hey, did you see that movie? You know, what? I don't, I don't know what was going on. And, you know, the next thing you know, you've spent, you know, 18 minutes talking about this movie that you don't want to see, right? And you start adding these things up in your day. And I've actually had a person do this, a, 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 a very famous pro athlete who I mentor is doing this right now as we speak. I said, I want you to log how many of these noise events happen in your life. And he's like, all right. And so he's calendaring these for one week to see how many of these things unconsciously comes into his world, right? Could be somebody just ragging on you. And, and then you add these up and say, well, hey, that was a six-minute event. That was a 20-minute event. That Wow, there was an hour and 48 minutes in my day where I had noise that really wasn't productive for my life. Now, I, said, I know this probably sounds a little nitpicky to your listeners, but you start adding up and you say, well, there's 10 hours a week I just found. And so you just divorce yourself of these noise events. Super helpful. And then you can take that and put in this stuff that's really productive, that really has value. And, you know, it sounds silly in a sense, but it really works. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, we've got a lot of similarities with our uh, morning routine. I think the only thing that I'm missing is the bed stretching. You know, I'm not doing the bed stretch, but I've checked every single box on everything else awesome. that you're doing there in the morning, just in a slightly yeah. different order, but I'm making it all happen the, Good. all the same. Uh, and so you said there, number one, just move, right? Just keep yeah. moving, keep your energy yeah. level up because you're moving. Number two, maintain a routine, have a good routine from sleep to your morning routine. Yeah. And number three, avoid the noise. And I don't think that's nitpicking at all. Judging by, I've got a, a friend of mine, that uh, won't mind me sharing his name, uh, John Roman one time was sharing with me how much uh, he just hated looking for the salt shaker. And so and for me, it was, I said, oh my gosh, how much time do I spend looking for my toothpaste? So I went out to Costco and bought about 30 bottles of toothpaste. And I put them everywhere, right? He added up how many hours over his lifetime yeah. he's going to spend just looking for that salt shaker. I did the same thing with the toothpaste. Yeah. Said, oh my gosh, I'm going to spend days of my life looking for toothpaste in right. the end. I better knock that thing out and get more efficient. Right. And it's, it's really about looking over your lifetime too, I think. You know, how much time do I have left? How much time am I going to be spending on these little activities that I could eliminate from my life? There's longevity, right? We've added days, yeah. months, years, ultimately, if we pay attention to those little things to our life, that is adding longevity. And exactly. in some of your uh, spaces, you have, I know in Aegis, you have a countdown clock. Well, and yeah, in our corporate I, I office, that goes along these lines. Well, our, our corporate office, we, we took the average lifespan of an American man, American woman. We blended it together. It's about 79 years of age. And we put it in hours and days and so on, put a countdown clock, and it goes backwards. I've actually seen people standing in front of it and crying. 
they're just looking at mm. it and they're going, oh my God. And, you know, and then it, below it, it says make today count. And, you know, what we're really trying to do is wake people up, wake, you know, shake them by the shoulders, wake, wake up, you know, come on. This is not, this this, this doesn't go forever. This is not a linear track until infinity. This, your life has a certain time span that, you know, it, it has an endpoint, and you have to realize today, and I got to maximize that. And so, you know, I mean, I love going on vacations and love laying on the beach and, you know, hanging out and so on. But, you know, I, I budget myself for those things as well. And is that is, is that along the lines of conscious longevity? Well, I think everybody's longevity should be conscious, right? I, I think I think most people's, and you know, I interviewed so many people for my book, Thirty Summers More. Um, most people thought the average age of people in America was eighty-five. You know, not not seventy-seven point six for men and seventy seventy-nine point eight for women. They thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to live to eighty-five. Well, I got, oh no. Well, if you're a guy, it's, it's about seventy-seven. They're like, you're kidding. I felt like you just took eight years off my life, you know? So it's, but it's also doing the things that, you know, can add to longevity. You know, the average person in Japan goes to the doctor 13 times. Um, and, a, a year or over the a life? A year, a year, yeah, 13 wow. times a year. In America, we do about four and a half. Now, uh, the interesting part of that is, Obviously, Japan is one of the healthiest nations in the world. They live the longest in the world, and they're doing things. They have a a uh, doctors are now writing prescriptions for people to do what's called forest bathing. So, if you come in with high blood pressure, before they give you a medication, they'll say, "Okay, Casey, um, four times a week for one hour, I need you to go walk in the forest." And what we found there's a concept called biophilia that some hospitals actually found by accident. Are you familiar with this concept? No. So what we found is nature actually affects our immune systems. You know, we're, we're people from the earth. And when we're out in nature, um, it has a positive effect that's a calming effect. It oxygenates our bodies, helps our cells, and it ups our immune system. And so there was an experiment done in, in a hospital. I, I apologize, I can't remember the name of it. But it was done by accident. They had two, two uh, uh, rooms that were postdoc rooms. One faced a garden and one faced a brick wall. And they found continuously the, the people that came out of surgery that faced the garden were healing twice as fast as the people that went into the brick wall room. And they thought, wow, that's what a coincidence. Well, it wasn't a coincidence. It was biophilia, which is really the, the life of living things, right? And so what, what they found is that, you know, I'm looking out. I have a garden off of this room that I'm in right now. And, you know, it is incredibly empowering to look at this. There's also this whole movement now called earthing. I don't know if you've heard of that, where um, – you know, people are actually walking even in the winter time barefoot out grounding. on the grass and earth. Yeah, they're grounding themselves, yeah. right? And you know, if you think about what happened in the '60s, uh, we got away from being more in nature. What happened in the '60s? We started building skyscrapers. You know, I mean, the '60s is here in Seattle. We built the Space Needle and had a dining room on top. You know, everybody was wanted to dine in the clouds. The other thing, I, you know, I'm a lot older than you, but when I was in the 60s and I was a little boy, we used to have these tennis shoes called PF Flyers. And, you know, you could run high. They were rubber, big, thick soles, and you could run fast and jump high. Well, in the 60s is when we started creating these synthetic, you know, soles with rubber and so on. Took, a, took us further off the earth, right? And then we developed things like thick pile shag carpeting and everything. We got further and further and further away from nature and natural products. And so now the theory is, well, we're getting further and further away from our natural elements as human beings, and that's having an effect on our health and our longevity. And there's, there's a, actually a very good earthing documentary out right now that where they're showing it's, it's changing diseases and everything else. So. 
You don't by any chance know the name of that. If not, uh, we'll look I, it up I, I and think we'll put it in the go- show notes. I think if you Google earthing documentary, you'll you'll find it. So okay. um, yeah, I've been really interesting uh, interested in the whole grounding uh, piece. Uh, I've got the kids running outside and they're barefoot, yeah. you know, in the winter, and I'll, I'll get home and say, "All right, guys, let's go outside and walk around barefoot for a while." Yeah, uh, yeah. You're talking about longevity. You're talking about hey, 75, 85 years old, um, and then you've got this countdown clock. And you know, I wonder what your thoughts are. You know, I, I don't know if you know who Dan Sullivan is of Strategic Coach. Uh, it's a business coaching group that I attend uh, every quarter. And you know, Dan is one of those who believes he's going to live to 156 years old. Mm-hmm. And he's currently 75. Uh, there are uh, other individuals that are in this group that are in the longevity field, uh, in um, the uh, bio- biology uh, field, the research field, and they believe they're going to live and to their 150, 170s. Uh, do you uh, think feel like there's any validity to those types of claims? Well, uh, given that we're going backwards, yeah. Let me answer it in a variety of ways. Um, is it possible to live to 170? Probably not. Um, I, I think if you lived in a perfect environment, you could probably live to 120, 130. But the reality is we don't live in a perfect environment. Let's, let's say you, you eat the best foods and everything else. Well, even, even the best foods are polluted. Um, you know, I, I went on an all-fish diet. Uh, you know, I was going to give up meat, and I just ate fish, and I did it for three months. My mercury counts went through the roof. Right, tuna and, and swordfish. Well, I, I wasn't eating high mercury fish. Huh. I, was, I was eating fresh salmon and, and sole and halibut and everything else. The problem was our waters are so polluted and the things we're flushing into our waters that they, they had immense mercury and lead. So I wasn't, I wasn't eating high mercury fish. And so my doctor said, stop eating fish for two weeks and see what happens. I stopped and my, my mercury count went right back to normal. So even if you think you're doing absolutely the greatest things, the environment is ruining our bodies, right? So, you know, it starts with food, you know, extends to your dry cleaner, the air you breathe, I mean, the water you drink, everything. And, you know, I'm very picky, you know, I drink oxygenated water, I drink Essentia. Um, I, you know, have all organic food. I mean, I do all those things. Do I think I'm going to live to uh, even 100? I don't. I think I can live to 93. In fact, on my vision board, I have a big 93 in the middle of it. And that, you know, that's, that's where I'm going. Now, here's the thing about your friends with wanting to live. I think your brain, again, is part of that huge programming center. So if you say, I'm going to live to 150, well, you may live to 100 and, you know, you, you're, you're fine. The body is really built to live to about 120, 130 years old. I mean, it, it is manufactured to. But you better be in an incubator by the time you're one day old to avoid all those pollutants and toxins that our world has out there for you. And so, you know, the oldest man in the world just died yesterday. He was 112 in Japan. So uh, is it possible? Yeah, maybe. I I think, again, some of these guys that own these large companies like Google and and the Gates and so on, I think they're going to do a tremendous amount to advance longevity. Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, Casey, you look at uh, right now, you know, I have, I have four major trips planned for the summer. I was on the phone with our, our executive travel agent just, you know, an hour ago. And she's like, well, God, we have a pandemic. I don't know if any of these are going to happen. So, I mean, you could be running every day and eating organic and, you know, your blood pressure could be 100 over 60 and your cholesterol 110 and you get hit with a p- pandemic and it's like, it's over. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, our world's imperfect from a health standpoint. Well, we should be focusing on our purpose every day, if yeah, that's the that's case. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know? However, we, we still want to live a long life. And so I'm curious, you know, we talked about you struggling with uh, eating fish. All of a sudden, you can't eat fish. You right. know, fish are supposed to be what's what's good for you, right? And maybe there's research out there saying the same thing about vegetables. I don't know. Right. Um, but it seems like everything could be really good or really bad for you right. the next day. And so what does uh, your your dining regimen look like what does your diet look like overall maybe you want to throw in there a little bit about supplements as well well i i think everybody's different right i I don't know if you've got into any of the blood type eating and so on 
Um, but I think, I think that has some real interest and significance. So essentially blood type eating tells you, you know, if you're A or B, A, A, B positive, whatever, you can go down and, and check your blood type and it tells you what foods interact with your chemistry. And I, I think that's significant. So I tend to follow blood type eating, which means I don't eat a lot of dairy, um, very little red meat, um, Try to avoid sugar. I think sugar is bad for everyone, but particularly bad for, for my blood type. And, you know, there's also blood type exercising. So certain people are built to exercise certain ways. Um, you know, I played football in high school. I was on the track team in college. I mean, but, you know, I was a shot putter. And so I was never meant to be a sprinter. I mean, I graduated high school. You know, I, I played nose guard on the football team. I weighed 243 pounds. So I've never been a, a little guy. You know, I've always been a big kind of bulky guy, lifted a lot of weights and so on. So I think, I think you have to eat for your body type and, you know, stop looking at the fashion magazine saying I should look like the guy on the cover of Men's Health. You know, it's, it's probably not going to happen. But, you know, look at your vitals and see what's happening. What's your cholesterol? What's your blood pressure? What's your blood sugar? What, you know, how are those things happening? I think, I think the height and weight chart should be lit on fire because it's, you know, I mean, I know pro athletes that are five, nine, right. weigh 235 pounds and have 4% <laughs> yeah, body. They're fat. obese. Yeah. yeah. So they're, you know, you got to lose 55 pounds, man. So I think, you know, I think that's a big deal. Um, so you just have to eat for your body type. You know, you have to yeah. eat, for what's good for you. And, and when it comes to exercise, do you believe, you know, you talked about your body type being different. You need types of different types of exercise. You know, does, is there a general theme as we age, you know, we go from our thirties into our sixties. Should we be exercising differently in our sixties than our thirties? Absolutely. Uh, what what Absolutely. should that look like? How should that evolve? And what if you've never exercised before? Where do you even yeah. start? Well, first of all, I hate the word exercise because it has a negative connotation, right? I have to go exercise. And, you know, I live in, in Europe two to three months of the year. You never hear people talk about exercise. In fact, it's very hard to find a gym. But what you see everywhere is people riding their bikes, people playing soccer in the parks, people walking, people climbing stairs. You see this everywhere. And they're much, much healthier than we are. They live, they live in Italy two years longer than Americans. So you look at that and you say, okay, well, maybe we got it all wrong. You know, maybe we shouldn't be in the gym. Maybe we should just go walk for an hour and a half every day. And, you know, I used to lift very heavy. I mean, even into my 40s, I was bench pressing over 300 pounds. And, you know, now, and I thought, well, you know, that was the thing. I'm going to have a big chest, big biceps, you know, it was playing to my ego. Well, now I have shoulder problems, you know, I have elbow problems because I lift, I lifted too heavy at wrong age. Now I, I use uh, bands, I use, uh, you know, very light weights, do more reps. I, I hung out with Sylvester Stallone a year ago and was interviewing him about his uh, exercise regimen. He goes, I don't lift weights anymore. I, I do Pilates, I use bands. Um, I do yoga. So the older we get, the more flexibility we need. And the big, big thing, Casey, the big thing, and this, this is something I'm hugely passionate about, is balance. Because you know what the number one way that people die in, when they get old is, is they fall. They fall. They break a hip. They go in the hospital. They're on their back for 30 days. They get pneumonia, and they die of respiratory failure. So if you look at how people die, they're like, oh, they died of respiratory failure. Well, that's terrific, but it's not really truthful. What they died of is poor balance because they trip or they got, you know, they just lost, got dizzy and mm -hmm. fell. That's why drinking water when you get elderly is so incredibly important because a lot of people don't drink enough, consume enough water. That the 80-some generation consumed a lot of coffee. Again, dehydrates your body, makes you dizzy, and, you know, it, it caffeinates you so they feel good, they feel energized. But drinking water is one of the most powerful things you do. And then doing balance exercises. You know, when you're brushing your teeth, stand on one foot for 60 seconds. When you're watching TV and the commercial comes on, try to stand on one foot for three minutes while the commercial's on. Do that. Program your brain to balance, and, you know, you'll, you'll be glad you did. Well, I could probably stay on this topic with you. I know I could on health for a long time, yeah. but I, I, I've got to get into, you know, with nine grandkids, uh, yeah. 
I just really want to get into that. We've got a lot of grandparents listening, and you've written a couple books uh, for children uh, and maybe even for your grandchildren here. Uh, and so I want to get into that. I think there's a lot of wisdom in those things. And one is uh, Saturdays with Gigi, um, and that is a children's book on dealing with grandparents with Alzheimer's. Right. Uh, why did you decide that that was a book that needed to be written? Well, I think I think there's a lot of fear from little kids about Alzheimer's. And, you know, all of a sudden your grandmother, or your great grandmother starts acting different and you don't understand it. And, and you know, it's difficult for a parent to explain, well, she has a, a brain disease that affecting her emotions and her, you know, the way she talks to people and so on and so forth. So, you know, I wrote a book. Uh, Gigi was what my uh, my kids called my um, my mother, a great grandmother. And so they would call her Gigi. And so I put my mom as a character in the book and, and tried to explain what was going on in the process of, of, of Alzheimer's. And again, I think it's a great book to kind of say, hey, this is, this is still a person you love, but they're going through a little disease problem that may make them act a little different now. And the book kind of goes into how some of those patterns typically manifest. So that was the first book I wrote. And then well, and what, what can parents learn from that, you know, as a parent or as a grandparent? I mean, you, right. you know, your mind's failing. Maybe you've had this diagnosis. What do you think you should be doing at that moment in communicating to your children or grandchildren? Well, one of the things I often see, because I'm, I, we deal with this problem all the time with our, with ageist living, but you know, one of the things that parents will try to do is, is keep the children or grandchildren away that's the worst thing you can do because they're fearful that they may say something inappropriate and it will shock the kids or whatever. And one of the things the parents can do is you got to educate your kid. This is part of life. You know, I, I mean, we used to do the same thing with Down syndrome's kids 50 years ago, you know, and say, oh, those are different and call them names and so on. The, the key to success here is this integration about how we communicate and educate our children that this, these are still part of our family, the people, still part of our, our neighborhood, our community, our part of our, love, our, our loved ones. But here's what's happening with them now, and that's going to make your kids smarter. And you can do that even at the age of five years old. You can tell them. You're not going to, you're not going to give, you know, uh, sophisticated scientific terms to them. You're not going to say, oh, your grandmother's experiencing Lewy body's disease today. You know, you're going to, you're going to talk to them about, hey, She's a little confused right now, and here's what's happening, and it's okay. You can still love grandma and so on. So I think, I think education, and that's what the book strives to do, is educate and be used as a teaching tool for, for parents to help their kids. Well, there's also some benefits there for those that might be suffering from Alzheimer's. Uh, and I, I, you wrote in your book that you should have friends that are 20 years younger than yourself. Well, right. having making sure you continue to bring those kids and grandkids around uh, grandma could lead to a better life. And I'm sure you've seen that in ages. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the support system, right? And when a person is going through that disease process, you need as big a support system as you can possibly have. The last thing in the world you want to do is start whittling away the support system and, you know, the things that bring that, that patient the most joy and, and, and smiles on their faces, their grandchildren, you start separating them and say, oh, the kids can't go anymore. That's, that's, a, that's a devastating impact for, for the person who's afflicted. But if you get this type of diagnosis, you might begin thinking, uh, well, what can I do today to make sure I retain some of this memory, some of these things that I want to pass on to my children, grandchildren? Maybe the grandchildren are only two or three years old. Maybe they aren't born yet, and you want to make sure that you pass on the wisdom that you hope to impart on that next generation or, or the generation that follows. Uh, would you do something like you did? You know, wrote that, big, that book, A uh, Big Life, Wisdom for My Children. Yeah, that seems like a good step to take at yeah. that time in your life. Yeah, you know, because my life has been so dominated with people who have memory loss, I, I wanted to say, hey, if, if I have to write down a hundred things that I want my grandchildren to know, what would it be? I, and, you know, I, I think ironically, Casey, I thought I would write this book in a week, you know. I'll just sit down and write down the hundred things. It took me about two and a half years to write this book because I kept, first I'm like, well, that's not that important. I'm going to go back and change that. And, oh, I forgot this. And even now I go back and go, oh, I wish I would have put these five things in that book and so on. And so, you know, so I wrote this book called The Big Life. And I was just, it was just originally meant for my grandchildren. It's just going to be circulated in my family. And I showed it to a few of my friends. And it became so popular that people said, well, I want, I want to give that to my children or my grandchildren. I, I want to show them what we, we did, 
how, how our family does it. And what ended up happening with the book was a really kind of interesting thing. We made it into a game where you can buy it now, it has dice, and you roll it, and it corresponds with a page, and you open the yeah. page, and you tell the story of whatever it is. And it, it, it makes no difference to me if you think my words are profound or you know resonate with you or whatever. What happened is that it's created a storytelling uh, stimuli. And so now families open up and they'll say, oh, you know, always buy the dirt, not the curtains. That's one of the expressions in there. And it's about buying a home. You know, and it's like, hey, really focus on the location, not the prettiness inside. And so uh, now people will say, well, God, I remember when my grandmother bought this house, and now it's been in our family for, you know, and she wanted a house down the street, and Grandpa said, no, this is a great location. And so, so I get now what is really fulfilling. This goes back to our living artifact conversation. I get these emails or texts or phone calls or whatever. They're like, I found out about this about my husband's family, and I've been married to him 25 years, and I never knew this existed. So it's bringing up all the storytelling. And now people take the book on vacation. They take it to the beach. They take it on road trips. They, you know, and, and they're creating this dialogue with their children that they would have never had had the, had the book not stimulated this conversation. And that's, that's been really a, a big life has really changed a lot of people's relationship with their own family because of that. Now, if you could just impart one piece of wisdom onto your children or grandchildren, what would that be? Oh man, you're putting me on the spot. Um, I, I just, I would just say, be kind, you know, be kind, you know, that I, I think, you know, that, that can serve everybody. Well, just be kind to other people. And, uh, you know, that's not, it's, it's harder sometimes than that sounds, but just be kind to people. Yeah, that's good. That's great. Uh, let, if you, if I may, as we wrap up with a couple minutes left, maybe sure. I can just uh, get into a couple uh, general, little uh, more philosophical questions. Um, and this, this has all been philosophical. I, I was going to say it really has <laughs> been. Um, but you know, I wouldn't. You, you've just you've met so so many people. Um, you've had I think it's it's probably more than this now, but over sixty thousand residents um, through Aegis and the yeah. assist living facilities, and um, you've gotten to spend some really quality time with a lot of your guests. Yeah. And I, I wonder, you know, what, do one of those residents stand out to you? What's the biggest lesson that you've learned from one of your residents? Well, I mean, I've, I've had some incredible people from the guy that worked on the Manhattan Project that created the nuclear bomb to the woman who invented Cheerios to the woman who played Jane in Tarzan movies. So I, I've, I've gotten to know, you know, some incredible people. Um, but I, I think uh, what they've taught me has influenced the things that I'm doing in, to a great degree. Um, one, your life will go by very, very fast. They say that. It will go by so fast that you'll, when you hit 80, go, how did I get here? You know, so don't, don't waste a minute on the noise, as we talked about, um, or you know, doing something you hate doing. If you're in a job that you hate, if you're in a marriage that you hate, you know, if you're in a friendship that you hate, don't waste a minute because it will, those will be your regrets, you know, so don't do that. Um, I think the second thing people talk about is always what we would think they talk about is family. The moments that you have with family, those special moments that you created these lasting memories that, you know, you'll laugh about, talk about for generations. I think that's important. You know, I mean, in talking to these people that are 100 plus years old, no one ever says, ah, oh, I wish I'd done that deal. I wish I'd made, you know, another $100,000. Or I wish I'd, you know, worked, spent more time at the, I mean, that doesn't never happens. It just never happens. So I feel very blessed. I call, I call my residents my oracles. And uh, in fact, for my 60th birthday, I made, a, I made a video that's now gone viral on YouTube called 60 Years of Wisdom. You can find it on YouTube. And, um, it's me narrating uh, what, what I learned over 60 years from all these people. And uh, I think that's been a profound gift for me. It's really shaped my life and, and probably shaped my legacy and my, my children and grandchildren's lives as well. 
Well, that's, that's uh, really amazing. We're, we're going to make sure we put a, a link to that in the show notes so that people can catch that video. I'm surely going to go back and, and give it a watch myself. Uh, and I, I know you've interviewed some amazing people. You mentioned some of them here. You know, Stallone, you've interviewed presidents of the United States, uh, actors and athletes. And uh, if you could pick one of those individuals, who stands out the most, who has made the biggest impact? In oh, man. Now you're going to have people mad at me. <laughs> Um, you know, I interviewed Carlos Santana and, uh, it was, it was funny. Um, I asked him to speak and, and, and I said, Carlos, I don't want you to talk about, you know, anything that you've done before. Um, I don't want you to speak about anything. I want, I want you to be vulnerable on stage. And I, I tend to tell a lot of people that cause you know, like you Casey, I don't want a canned presentation. And, uh, he got up. Well, first of all, he was he was in the green room and he was really nervous. I'm like, Carlos, what? I mean, this is like this is like 150 people. You don't have to be nervous. He's like, yeah, but I don't have my guitar. I don't have my band. And he was like visibly super nervous. And I'm like, wow, you know, this guy's a human being, and I, he's got a great soul. I love this man. And uh, he got up and he talked about his first marriage and how his uh, how his marriage had uh, broken up and. And he was, he was, he got very emotional about it. And, and he, he, he didn't say he was suicidal, but he said, he, you know, it was kind of at his wits end. And he's having this conversation with, uh, w- with what he kind of termed his greater being, you know, whether that's God or whatever. And he said, you know, I was ready to just my life to be over. And, and he said, I had this conversation and he said, I need you to let go of the past with the one hand that's holding on to it because your future is going to be so heavy. Um, you need uh, both hands to carry it. Hmm. I just thought, hmm. you know, that was so, and, you know, the way he told the story was so profound and just so emotional that, you know, I think a lot of times we go through life with one hand, you know, carrying some baggage that, you know, maybe it's trauma, maybe it's, you know, a bad relationship, maybe it's a broken heart, whatever. But that one hand is behind your back, Karen. So you don't have both hands available to, you know, have this, this incredible future. And, you know, that left an indelible impression on me. Yeah. Uh, that's beautiful. That, that is profound. Thank you so much for sharing that. I wouldn't have thought that would have come from Carlos Santana. So yeah. uh, that's awesome to hear. Uh, you know, I, I, I actually came across you for the first time uh, when I was walking through the airport looking for my book, Job Optional, and uh, I noticed 30 summers more sitting right. right next to mine on the shelf. And I said, who's this guy? So uh, <laughs> I started looking at you. I said, boy, you know, this would just be a great fit for a podcast guest. And I got in the book. I said, well, this is a great book that can add tremendous value to a lot of individuals' lives out there. And uh, you were so gracious as to send us some books over here at Howard Bailey. And we are going to give those away. So if you're listening, you want a copy of 30 Summers More, all you have to do to get that copy of the book is write a review for the podcast. You can do that right on your podcast app. Scroll down to the bottom, leave a review there, or you can go to retirewithpurpose.com. Click on the podcast tab. It says right there on the top, it says leave your leave a review. Leave a review on iTunes, an honest review, and send us an email at info at howardbailey.com. That's info at howardbailey.com your screen name, and we will send you out a copy at no cost, no obligation of 30 summers more from us and from Dwayne here to your doorstep. So uh, we hope you take advantage of that. I know Dwayne does as well. Dwayne, uh, anything else that you would like to mention uh, where people can connect with you or anything that maybe we missed that you want to hit on before you wrap up? No, I I have a website. It's uh, Dwayne, D-W-A-Y-N-E, J. Clark. And so you can find out about where in the world I am and what I'm doing and projects and so on that I'm, that I'm around and, you know, follow me on Instagram at Dwayne J. Clark. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I tend to do videos and podcasts and uh, I have a podcast called walk this way and I have another one called wellness warriors. So walk this way is more business oriented and wellness warriors is, is health oriented. So. 
Awesome. Well, Dwayne, I know you're a bit of a pool shark as well, so hopefully we'll get a chance <laughs> to uh, play a little pool uh, at some point, some point in the future. Thank you for joining us. All right, Casey. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Dwayne, that's a wrap. Was that okay? Hey. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah, good. I really appreciated it. Thank you good. so much for making the time to do this. I, My I hope pleasure. it was good for you. Oh, it was fun. It was lots of fun. Good. And you, you work with Charlie as well, huh? Yeah, we started working with Charlie uh, about a year and a half ago. Okay. So, and we are uh, wrapping up on our contract now. Um, and I don't, you know, we'll probably take a little hiatus before I uh, finish up the next book for 2021 sir, or 2022. Good, good, good. What's your next oh. book? Uh, well, we never have a title until it's written, right? right. But, uh, you know, it's still kind of early on in uh, the stages of development. It's more in my head than anywhere else right now. But right. Uh, still trying to work on this job optional campaign. Sure. But the thought is... Uh, it's going to be more purpose-based, right? So we're really going to uh, have the book focus in on uh, how to identify purpose, create purpose in your life, and ultimately develop more meaning uh, through the use of tools and stories and uh, just the process uh, that we utilize uh, for the families we work with. So it's going to take a little bit of a development, but we're going to get there soon. If you ever need another resource, I have a good friend who's a CEO that wrote a book on purpose and work. Um, his dad was a New York congressman. His name's Randy Ottinger, Randy Joe Ottinger. And I'm trying to remember what his book was, uh, but it was something on purpose. Great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd love okay. to make that connection. Yeah. Just reach oh. out. Okay. All right, Casey. Thanks a bunch. Hey, thank you Have so much. Have a great much. day. Appreciate yeah, it. You too. Appreciate right. it. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.